Support for this and other KLRU productions made possible by the Producer Circle, ensuring local programming that reflects the character and interests of the greater Austin, Texas community. If you really want to play, these cats set aside a day. Grab your duds and come and meet the June to you Jamboree. If you really want to spree, chicks galore are guaranteed. Grab your duds and come and meet the June to you Jamboree. Yeah. Welcome to Juneteenth Jamboree, your annual celebration of freedom. I'm your host, Harrison Epright. <laughs> Juneteenth is a special time for parades, fun food, and an abundance of educational and entertainment opportunities. The holiday is frequently described as a family reunion because just about everybody shows up for it. And with that in mind, here at the historic Sebastopol House, also known as the Wilson Pottery Museum, we'll learn about some enterprising brothers in slavery who made the most of their training and their eventual freedom. Today, their descendants have come together to protect and preserve their legacy. And where's my 40 acres and my mule? Well, it sure ain't here. But on this program, we're reviving the old Reconstruction Era Freedmen's Bureau and the records created by that eight-year exercise in promoting freedom and opportunity. The Mormon Church has been very instrumental in bringing those records up to digital speed through the Freedmen's Bureau project. And we'll meet two people who've gained extraordinary gifts in life from simply knowing who their people are. Juneteenth began on the 19th of June in 1865 in Galveston, Emancipation Day in Texas. That happened to come a couple of months after the end of the Civil War. The sheer remoteness of Texas gave the Confederate state the ability to hold out as long as it could before President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation laid down the law but slavery remained legal and continued in a few so-called border states until the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in December of 1865, which abolished slavery throughout the land. So Texas slaves were not the last slaves, but make no mistake about it, Texas was a serious slave state. African bondsmen were arbitrarily separated from their families in order to provide the best value and efficacy. They were mere pawns in a game of whites only ascendancy. African bondsmen and women were victims of the times, times before the concept of civil rights was a thing. Now people say that if you don't know where you've been, then you can't know where you're going. Some people today still have no clue who their grandparents are, much less their forebearers in slavery. Why should it matter? Coming up next are some folks who can share with us a little bit about their roots. Austin, Texas was founded back in 1839 and was designated to become the capital of the Republic of Texas. Ever since then, it's been on an extraordinary development binge and nearly doubled in size every 20 years. Back in the day, 1888, the current state capitol building was built by crews of migrant workers and black prison convicts. A new state university was rising not far from downtown. Congress Avenue, the main street in town, got paved in a sign of growing prosperity. But just like the median down the middle of the street, there was a strict color line in Austin. After working in a white-owned funeral home as an undertaker for African Americans only, in 1901, William Tears opened the first black-owned mortuary in Texas. And as tears prospered, 
others entered the segregated market. In 1933 came Charles King and his wife from Memphis. And around 1955, Tears Funeral Home merged with King Funeral Home. Now, a younger generation of kings has taken over the reins of the company. What we do as a ministry, uh, we're there in time of need. My experiences in life have brought me to that point where I've been blessed enough to be able to sit down and talk to someone um, and not get emotionally involved, but also be there as a sounding board. That's basically what my job is, and make the process less stressful. Because of the oral history transmitted through his family for over 200 years now, King believes that he descends from Thomas Jefferson, the principal author of the Declaration of Independence and the third American president. My dad would always tell us about Thomas Jefferson. I was basically ashamed of it. Well, I'm not ashamed anymore, but as a kid, if I go to elementary school and tell people I'm Kenneth Thomas Jefferson, they're going to say, you're crazy. Back in the day, it became popular knowledge that Jefferson had relations with a female slave by the name of Sally. Commentators ask, did Thomas Jefferson father five children with his slave paramour Sally Hemings? This question has even been given an official name, the Jefferson Hemings controversy. In 1998, genetic testing was conducted on Jefferson and Heming's descendants. The results suggested that Thomas Jefferson likely did commit miscegenation with Sally Hemings decades before that very word was conceived of, and Monticello opened its arms to new cousins. But what really brought the light to me is when they invited us to come to Monticello, and we were offered we could be buried in a cemetery on Monticello. Okay, that's what struck me as surprising. Um, and that's when I really realized that, hey, there's something to this, so that's when it came to light, because for so many years, it was denied. I love my neighborhood. You know, they, at one time, they used to call it Colored Town. Ollie Giles is a student of history. Living half an hour from Austin in San Marcos, she has filled her home with books. As a professional researcher, she's visited nearby and distant reservoirs of public records, searching for what she calls true history. And let it be known, Ms. Giles is not shy about telling the truth. It's been years that I got interested in family, and I would ask my grandmother because my grandmother would tell me stories. When I was a little girl, she said she worked one time in a white woman's house and cleaned, and she couldn't use the bathroom. She cleaned the bathroom, she couldn't use it. They told her to go out in the backyard. And she said, I don't need this. And that's when she took off her apron and came home and started her own business. And then my grandmother would tell me about family and all of this. And I dug up true history. I went to Washington, went to the National Archives, and found history right here in St. Marcus, free people. And I thought, why did they give us the slave mentality when we, we didn't all come here as slaves? You were with me when I took you around the city cemetery. African Americans owned that and sold it to the city. It used to be the Peyton Roberts colony. It was an African American, a Negro colony. And they buried on the back of it and they built their little homes on the front and they had a part of the land as uh, where, they where they planted food and stuff. And I've got a deed where Doc Roberts even raised cotton here because he sold a bale of cotton for a dollar. It's Gray's buried here and uh, Lachey's and all of that buried here. And it was known as a Negro colony. Peyton Roberts' children 
Peter Roberts, the father of Doc Roberts, so start selling property because the older people start dying out or moving out of the colony. And they start selling this part as a cemetery to the San Marcos City Cemetery. Peter Roberts left it to Doc Roberts and he sold. And on one of the deeds where he sold it to the city cemetery, when I went to commissioner's court on one of the deeds, he said, I, Doc Roberts, colored. I said, he didn't say what color he was, but he said that he sailed to the cemetery, uh, San Marcos Cemetery Association and told the price that he sold it for. And then the city bought property and they start moving down further to the fence line. But it is lots of African American, free African Americans buried out here. In one little map, they got slave burial. And I told them to take that off, change that map. I want the true history to be told here. People are beginning to bury it. It's, it's just buried along with some of the dead. Arturo Alfonso Schomburg was an Afro-Puerto Rican-American born in 1874. When he was a child, an ill-informed teacher told him that black people had no history and no accomplishments. Piqued by this opinion, Schomburg strived to learn more, and over time he became a prominent intellectual during the Harlem Renaissance. His collection of Afrocentric materials became the basis for the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City. Arturo Schomburg once said, history has become less a matter of argument and more a matter of record. The records of the Freedmen's Bureau are primary sources about African Americans during Reconstruction, also known as the U.S. Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. President Lincoln created the agency to provide an orderly transition from powerlessness to empowerment for former slaves and others in the aftermath of the Civil War. After a short time, it faced a ton of resistance from white Southerners and other political sources. Today I'm humbled once again to be part of a historic announcement that can, on paper, potentially reunite the black family that was once torn apart by slavery. But the records of the Freedmen's Bureau remain extant, gems of knowledge and a wealth of data. Happily, this time the records are 10 times greater, comprising an estimated 4 million names, and this time the black community is uniting to help create a wonderful tool with which to discover its own family. Family Search International, in association with others, has been polishing those historical nuggets to a virtual shine by a core of volunteer indexers responsible for transcribing the handwritten records to a modern digital database. Sarah Lowe is one of the local leaders. There is this huge stereotype that because someone is African American, especially because they have slave ancestors, that they shouldn't try to learn anything about their family, that they should you know, just let it go to the ravages of time. And it's only fitting that we reach back through time and make it possible for their families to find them. So next, go to view. Now are they going to help me in real time? Or? Byron Morgan is training to become an indexer for the Freedmen's Bureau project. A relative newcomer to genealogy, he is like many who want to penetrate the barrier to pass knowledge that is American slavery. As an African American, um, it's very difficult once you start going back three or four generations in order to ascertain the information you need to do family history. Unlike my wife, who is Caucasian, whose family history goes back to the 6th century that's been documented by her father, and he's given those records to me, and we've bridged the gap between my family and her family, which is great. Like his father before him, Alan Johnson joined the LDS in order to seek his spiritual goals. 
and when the church mobilized to support the Freedmen's Bureau project, we approached Austin's George Washington Carver Genealogy Center to see if it too could become a part of this historic movement. It's very important because our goal is to unite all the people of the world. We did the Freedman Bank records. That was back in 2001. And I was a part of getting the, the word out on those and that helped a lot of African Americans. And that was just 70,000 names. This is four million names. So this is, should help the majority of African Americans find their ancestors. All across the land, there is high anticipation for the Freedmen's Bureau project. At the city of Austin's Carver Genealogy Center, Cynthia Evans presents regular workshops free to the public. So this is the family group sheet, and for most people, they probably love this one because it does have husband and then it has the recent TV shows about genealogy have helped to promote genealogy, but they make it look so easy. So people walk in and they have 15 minutes and they'll say, I want to do my genealogy and get all of my family history. I mean, and it really is more of a lifetime pursuit. I had my DNA examined and I'm 80 for 80% 80 from North Africa and 20% from Europe. So I'm excited about the Freedmen Bureau records because I'll be able to go back further on the African side, because that is very important uh, to, to understanding who I am. You can take advantage of this new online resource at discoverfreedmen.org. Happy hunting. This next story is what brings us here to the Sebastopol House in Seguin, Texas. In June 2013, the city of Seguin opened the doors to the Wilson Pottery Museum. One of the oldest towns in Texas, Seguin is located 40 minutes northeast of San Antonio and an hour's drive south of Austin. It's a destination mostly for folks who already live here in Guadalupe County. Seguin takes their heritage very seriously and very fondly, but as much as we are growing, we want to appreciate what we've come from and preserve that past and acknowledge the importance of that heritage that we are built on. One proud item of heritage would likely be the town's namesake, Juan Seguin, a Mexican citizen who was born in San Antonio and became a leader in the Texas Revolutionary Army, the Republic, and early statehood. He got out of the Alamo just in time to alert uh, the people uh, in what's called the runaway scrape that Santa Ana was coming along the Guadalupe and headed towards San Jacinto, the coast. Uh, and so what's important to note about Juan uh, Napomoncino Seguin is that he has been called the Paul Revere of Texas for that reason. Another proud item of heritage is Old Capote Road that takes travelers several miles southeast of Seguin to a place where Salt Creek runs across a certain type of soil, the perfect mix for making pottery. The chief uh, resource required for pottery is, is clay. There are outcroppings, they're called, of, of stoneware clays that run through Texas, through central Texas and east Texas, and then across the south. And this is where um, the potteries tended to be located because there was a tremendous amount of work and effort required to quarry the clay, you might say, dig the clay, process the clay, wash the clay, and so forth. And so this is very heavy work. Reverend John McCamey Wilson brought his family and around 20 slaves to Texas in 1856 and soon opened the first Guadalupe County pottery in the Capote Hills. And that is how Hiram and James became Wilson brothers by name. 
I'm sure they would be very surprised to find their things uh, on display in an art museum uh, many, many decades later. Um, but that's a testament to their skill and to their fine eye. The Wilson Pottery is especially significant because it was established by people who were formerly enslaved in 1869, or about 1869. A number of people established their own pottery called H. Wilson & Company, which was then one of the first businesses established in Texas by African Americans. As slavery came to an end, they remained united. They remain, they supported each other. And that's part of the legacy of the Wilson family, was that it did not just include those that shared the same blood. It included those that lived together as brothers, supported each other. I believe it was when the World Fair. Yes, Hemisphere. When the Hemisphere was held in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. That was the first. I think so. Uh, uh, notoriety, I guess, mm -hmm. given uh, to uh, the pottery business. And the curator there told another artist, not me, that he had uh, some Wilson's pottery work that he was going to exhibit, and that they were from Seguin. And he said they were Wilson's. And I said, well, if they're Wilson's, they're related to me. And then he told that artist to come on, let's go downstairs and I'll show you some of the artwork. And so I got up and I was running behind them. I just kept saying, if they're related to me, you know, if they're from Seguin, they're, they're related to me. And he said, oh, do you uh, genealogy and prove it. And that's so. something you don't want to tell my mother is to prove it, because then that's when she, oh, that was a done deal. <laughs> yeah, so then I couldn't wait to get, get through there that day so I could run home and I could start doing the research. Didn't know how to do that, but I jotted down everything that I came across. So when I got ready to do the book, it was easy because I had the information there. It, it's interesting, I, I look at it, uh, we are third generation from slavery. We are. We're just a third generation from slavery. From slavery. Our, mm -hmm. our great grandfather, Hiram Wilson, was the slave that was brought mm -hmm. here to Texas. We have, uh, uh, we have to preserve. We, we have to preserve. Uh, we have a, a name that, uh, um, although it was a name that um, was not possibly or probably, we know, mm -hmm. was not our Grandpa Hiram's name. Mm -hmm. We don't know who his father was. Right. We don't know who his mother was. And as the slaves, you know, took on the slave owner's name. Right. But um, be that as it may, we hold strong to that name, right. Wilson. The Pottery Foundation has been instrumental in, in preserving his pottery and the things that got him to the point where he could form a church and a school and everything for the community. So now what we're trying to do is form something to keep his legacy going as far as his church is concerned with the revitalization and the restoration of his church, mm -hmm. of the Capota Baptist Church. The school church. is gone. The school is the gone. The school's been gone yes. for, for many years. Many, many, many years. But the, but the church still stands. Yes. Isn't that just ironic that God's word still stands? Yeah. And that doesn't fall. This is the, the welcome sign being raised. Okay, here's Cheryl. She is the new Harmon James Wallace Wilson reunion president. My first introduction into the Wilson family and its breadth was at the 1987 reunion. I walked in the room there, 300 people who I were kin to. Very, <laughs> uh, gives you a sense of humility like you couldn't believe. At that time, I was just sort of like a reunion attendee, you know, and there was not anything going on in between reunions for me until the suggestion was made for us to form a uh, historical foundation. Now we have Cleo and John. Cleo has been busily painting for shards most of the day. And um, she's about to wrap it up. Say hello to the camera. Hello there. Hey, wave, wave to the family. <laughs> hello family. <laughs> hello family. <laughs> we had this legacy, you know, of going with us about uh, our ancestors being potters and the first black businessman in the state of Texas and the 
the legacy of their pottery that they made uh, being uh, valued as fine art and commanding four and five figured money. I think that uh, in some ways that I can do influence a lot of other families, black or white, you know, that uh, the uh, pursuit of your own background and origin, you know, is something that can be uh, very rewarding, it's fun, and it's informative, all of the above. Family to me, in, in my case, it would be the Wilson family. That means everyone who has a bit of DNA like I have, <laughs> coming from those two ancestors, Hiram and James. So we've seen today that some people can learn so much about their roots that they will often find more purpose in their lives. I hope that you take the opportunity to find your roots and perhaps feather your path too. Thanks for watching Juneteenth Jamboree. And they really pitch a ball, loader wigs, the jobs and all. Everything is strictly free, the Juneteenth Jamboree. There's no shirking, no one's working. Everybody stop. Guns are chopping, corks are popping, doing the Texas hop. That's the kill from head to feet. Baskets full of food to eat. You can't get this on your TV. The June Thief Jamboree. The June Thief Jamboree. The June Thief Jamboree. Support for this and other KLRU productions made possible by the Producer Circle ensuring local programming that reflects the character and interests of the greater Austin, Texas community.